Okay, so for those of you who weren't here last week, um, anybody not here last week? Okay. Um, the first reading was from Sankaran Krishna's book, uh, Globalization and Postcolonialism. Um, Krishna is right up here in Saunders on the sixth floor. And, uh, and he's... Uh, He's from India, and we'll be talking about him in the in the PowerPoint. But um, was everybody able to get all the books, except for Sharp? It's actually back. Sorry. Oh, it's back now. Can you get all the books on the syllabus? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Are um, they online, or do you have to buy them all? Uh, some of them might be able uh, available as an ebook, but they're not uh, available online for free. If that's what you mean. Um, there is one a book by the author Harawida that I'm going to send you, kind of a chapter of. But other than that, yeah. Um, as you get towards 400 and up to 600 level classes and higher, um, it ends up being multiple books. You know, and we don't have textbooks because these classes are very um, kind of a niche, very unique topics. Um, I created this class, so there's not a one textbook that we can use, uh, so we have to use multiple books. Um, and I tried to get books that we can at least read several chapters from and not just one little part of it and then... You had to buy the whole book for one part. Um, so a lot of this chapter, it's it's just vocabulary, right? So we're going to be talking about the, the terms. Um, for judging by your majors, a lot of you are going to be entering uh, kind of a new um, a new world of uh, what we call theory or sometimes called high theory. So I'm going to try to define all the terms. Um, but one of the things we're talking about is epitomized by this uh, New Yorker magazine cover and a quote that Krishna said to me once. Um, if you look at this cover, it's, it's Manhattan. It's Manhattan, so you got 9th Avenue, 10th Avenue, and then the Hudson River. You got Jersey. And then basically California and the Pacific Ocean and Japan. It's this very much foreshortening. So this is, this is called the New Yorker's view of the world. Right? The idea that the distance between 9th Avenue and 10th Avenue is the same as the distance between uh, the Hudson River and California. And also the same as across the whole Pacific Ocean to, to Japan. That New Yorkers are very provincial. They think that uh, Manhattan is the center of the world and the only place that really matters. And there's a reason why they think that. Um, Manhattan is the center of both the publishing industry, most major books that are published come out of New York City, and also the um, Wall Street, also the fashion industry, also Broadway. It's all right there, so you can, you can, uh, you might say they can a little bit be forgiven for thinking that they're the center of the world, but of course they're not. Um, and it creates this very distorted view. That, that same view was seen by Krishna himself. Um, I studied post-colonialism with Krishna. I had a, a kind of one-on-one -on -one course that I did with him. And he told me that he used to teach in New York uh, State at Colgate University. And he was teaching about India. He's, he's from India. He's an expert on Indian economics. And... Uh, some of the professors there, so he was in political science, and these professors would have very, very specific topics. So they wouldn't just teach political science, they would teach only the Constitution, only voting behavior, something really specific. But when he came in, they said, oh, you know, you teach about India, can you, can you just teach about China too? As if they're sort of just blended together. And it's the same kind of uh, distorted view, this sort of New Yorker's view of the world. Uh, I'm not making this up. The New Yorker uh, magazine is kind of aware of that. I think that, that, that picture kind of in, 
uh, captures that. Um, and that is what uh, Orientalism is about, which we're going to get to in a minute. So some terms. Uh, Post-colonial. Um, Krishna is really good at sort of encapsulating things. And so I'll just read it the way that he said it. The post-colonial is the perspective or worldview of those who believe that it is possible to understand today's world only by foregrounding the history of colonialism. Now, when I teach my, the high school kids, I always tell them, when you get to college, just yell out the word colonization randomly. And the professors will stroke their chin and kind of nod, yes, yes. Because there's always something related to colonialism, usually in whatever they're talking about. And I told them, don't do it in the science class, right, or computer science or something like that, or engineering, but social sciences, humanities, English, all of those. Um, usually you can make the connection. That's kind of what he's saying here. It's only possible to understand today's world by looking back at colonialism, colonization. Just to put it in perspective, there are 193 countries in the world right now, and about 38 of them are in Europe, and Europe colonized everybody else. Out of, the, out of what's left, so about 160 or so countries, only five were not touched by colonialism. So basically every country in the world outside of Europe was affected by colonization. And I think I can name four of the five. Um, uh, Thailand, Ethiopia, Japan, um, and Tonga. Tonga was never fully colonized. And there's one more that I, I, I can't quite remember. I can never quite remember. Uh, but that's pretty much the whole world, yeah. Is it New Zealand? No, New Zealand was colonized by the British, yeah, yeah. And you could go on and on like that. Every country, most countries that exist now are former colonies that decolonized. And so now they, they have decolonized. They are post-colonial. They are after colonial. That's what post-colonial means, this, this era after colonization. And the reason it's a theory is because you have to start to gain the uh, skill of thinking post-colonial, thinking in a way that's after the colonies, because part of colonization is making the colonized feel inferior, making them feel that their culture is not as good as that of the West. Of the West. We'll talk more about that when we get to Said. Now, uh, this chapter is called Genealogies of the Post-Colonial. So what is genealogy? Now, we're not talking about um, when you do your genealogy and go on Ancestry.com. We're talking about a method. Genealogy is a method that traces back the way that you might trace back your ancestry. But instead of looking for the connections, like you are connected to your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, it's looking for the breaks, it's looking for the ruptures. Um, so it's kind of a disruptive method. It's kind of premised on the idea that uh, what we think of as how we got to where we are is a broken story. It's a broken story. Uh, uh, just to give you an example, um, the Greeks, in Greece right now, they always talk about their proud heritage going back to Socrates and Athens and all of this. But in reality, they don't speak the language, they don't speak ancient Greek, they speak a different language. Um, and for the most part, they're, they're not directly connected to the ancient Greeks. They are, there's a, been a whole wave of in-migration, they were conquered by the Ottomans. So Greece today doesn't have a direct connection, Greek culture today doesn't have a direct connection really to ancient Greece. And so their, their story, their narrative of being connected to that you can pretty easily find the breaks in it. And that would be uh, using a genealogical method. Um, I'll give you another example because this genealogy was my methodology that I used in my dissertation. 
One of the books that I looked at was called The Fundamental Law of Hawaii. Um, by the way, what did anybody know what today is? <coughs> Sorry? The 125th anniversary of the overthrow. Yeah, sorry. Okay. So today is the 125th anniversary of the overthrow, January 17th, 1893. Uh, in 1993, there was the 100th anniversary, and this was supposed to be the biggest um, observation or observance of that since 1993. This is now 125 years. So I went down to the palace today. Um, so the overthrow is a very, very contentious topic, which we will talk about next week. But, um, or we can talk about it this week since it's uh, timely. Um, in my research, I looked at a book that was written by the guy who was the mastermind of the overthrow. Anybody know who that is? His name is on the chapel of Punahou. <laughs> That's not a coincidence. <laughs> Lauren Thurston. So Sanford Dole was the president of the government after the overthrow, but Lauren Thurston was really the mastermind of it. And he wrote a book uh, in 1903 called The Fundamental Law of Hawaii. And at the very beginning of the book, he lists the sequence of laws. So it's a, it's a narrative. It's a, it's a genealogy. It's this sequence. And it starts out with the Constitution of 1840, which is a pretty legitimate place to start. And it goes through the other constitutions. It goes through the constitution called that we call the Bayonet Constitution, which the name itself tells you that it's an illegal constitution signed at the end of a gunpoint. And then he talks about a treaty of annexation and then a joint resolution of annexation. Now, we're going to talk about this a lot more next week. But you don't have to know really anything about Hawaiian history to know that Hawaii wasn't annexed twice. right? Why well, wasn't annexed twice? So why would you have a treaty of annexation and a joint resolution of annexation on the American side? Well, that right there is, is a break. That is a rupture in that genealogy. Why does he put that in? Because he is a lawyer, Columbia trained lawyer, and he knows you can't annex without a treaty. And so he puts the treaty in. The thing is that treaty failed in the Senate. Uh, he also knows that Hawaii was actually annexed by a joint resolution, which is illegal. So he puts that in because that actually happened. So he has these two documents for annexation. You don't need two documents. Hawaii wasn't annexed twice. So that's, that's a ruptured genealogy. And, and you might think, oh, that's Lauren Thurston. Doesn't really matter. Nobody's going to take him seriously. But actually, that, that book is cited in major law cases today including the case Doe versus Kamehameha, where they tried to overthrow Kamehameha's admissions policy. Is this all making sense? I know not everybody's from here originally, but um, that's what we're talking about with genealogy. It doesn't seek to make the connections. It seeks to find the breaks. And because it's really looking to disrupt the colonial narrative, right? because it's a false narrative that's imposed on the colony. Okay, another term you might have come across is hegemony, hegemony. Um, right now we're living in a time of, uh, United, of American hegemony. There's one superpower, it's the United States. Uh, the U.S. does somewhere between 38 and 50% of all military spending in the world. Um, it's uh, military is bigger than the next nine militaries combined, the next nine biggest militaries combined. Uh, not in terms of um, people, but in terms of spending. Um, the United States has 800 military bases in 130 countries. That is hegemony. It's not really debatable. So we're definitely living in an era of uh, U.S. hegemony. 150 years ago, it was British hegemony. Right? Britain controlled a quarter of the surface of the earth. It was definitely... Um, you know, they used to say the sun doesn't, never sets on the British Empire, right? Because it was so large that the, it was always daytime at some part of the British Empire. And then we mentioned tricontinentalism. Um, there's been a long uh, a sequence of ways to describe this, this global inequality that there are the haves and the have-nots. 
right? So do you call it east and west? Well, Korea's in the east. Korea is, you know, Korea has better roads than Hawaii does. Yeah. Um, everything's new, really good infrastructure. So that's in the east, so east and west, and same with Japan. Japan was the second biggest economy for a long time. So east and west doesn't quite work. So then they started to say north and south. Okay, but then you got Australia and New Zealand in the south. Definitely first world western settler societies. So north and south works a little bit better than east and west, but not quite. So the, the new way to say it is tricontinentalism, that we're really talking about three continents, Africa, Asia, and South America as the, um, as the subaltern, the, the have-nots in the global system. Okay, uh, getting a little bit more esoteric. Um, there's the term mimesis or mimicry. It comes from the word mime, right? That you see uh, the Western, the Western, the Western way, and then you try to copy it, right? So even in Hawaii. Um, the Ali'i started to dress in military regalia with those epaulettes, right? And um, uh, it's the colonial subject desiring to be like the colonizer. This is an interesting idea. There's a writer named Franz Fanon who was uh, <laughs> from the Caribbean, but he was part of the freedom fight in Algeria. He helped Algerians get there independence from France. And he had an interesting observation which said that, uh, say someone from a, a French colony, like he was from, he was from an island called Martinique. He would go to Paris and get this fancy education and he would come back, right, and he's like wearing a beret and has the striped shirt and speaking perfect French. And, and then his fellow Martiniquans are kind of uh, admiring a little bit jealous of him, a bit envious. Um, but he, what he said was, if you have the slightest flaw in your mimicry of France, then they would just drag you down and say, "Oh, you're not, you're not actually French. You're just like the one, one of us. You're just putting on a show." And that would happen if you had the slightest flaw. But as long as you can pull it off, you can um, sort of become French and become superior to your former compatriots in the colony. Does that make sense? So how would you like compare that with assimilation? That's a great question. Um, I think assimilation is when, like in Hawaii. So in Hawaii, it's not like a colony in a sense, right? They're, they're fully here. America's fully here, pretty much assimilation is happening. If you're talking of, uh, about, say, American Samoa, it's still a little bit outside, right? They're still speaking their language. Um, you might see this kind of mimicry in American Samoa, but in what you'd see assimilation. That's how I would think of it, but that's a great question. Okay. So you're going to see the word other, other in a capital O, with a capital O. Other is simply that which is not you, and, the, and you being the privileged, uh, privileged uh, colonizer. So anybody who's not you is the other. They're not like you. Um, Orientalism is a lot about the other. Um, they even use the term othering, making into an other. Uh, this word is used a lot in this in this field. Um, it's kind of thrown around a bit. Okay, and then finally, subaltern. Uh, the the writer and translator Gayatri Spivak. She was a colleague at Columbia with um, Edward Said in the English department. 
she did a lot of translation work, um, like she translated Derrida from French into English, which if you've ever read him, that's a very like incredibly difficult thing because his whole thing is wordplay, and how do you translate wordplay, right? How do you translate puns? <laughs> puns are like the lowest form of humor, and my favorite, but um, they're language specific, right? Things that rhyme, things, words that sound like each other. How do you do that from one language to another? It's, it's like, I don't know how she does it. She calls it backbreaking work. But in, as part of her work, she looks at um, the subaltern. And uh, she asks the question, can the, sub can the subaltern speak? And her conclusion was, no, they cannot. Uh, for reasons of lacking access to education, She's talking about the, the extremely poor of India, in this case. Um, they're not able to have a voice. And um, my PhD advisor, Noe Noe Silva in poli-sci, uh, she used this theory to look at the subaltern of Hawaii, and she, she found that, that conclusion very troubling and tried to reverse it and say, in, in the case of Hawaii, the subaltern could speak. Uh, but how do they speak? We might not, uh, they might not speak in the ways that we're used to listening to. They might not write it down. Um, and the word subaltern actually is a British, is from the British military. It literally means someone of, of inferior rank. So if you're like a major and then you're speaking to a corporal, that corporal is your subaltern, someone below you. But then it was taken to mean um, race and class, uh, lower rank of in terms of race and class. Okay, any questions with any of those terms? Because they, at least some of them will be, will be hearing them throughout the whole course, not just this week. Although the readings will not be like this. They're gonna be much more straightforward. It's not gonna be much more just a historical narrative describing the events. Uh, situation with each of the case studies we're going to look at. Okay, okay. A little more on genealogy. Um, genealogy has two sort of uh, founding thinkers. One is Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, <laughs> this is kind of a enigmatic quote, but one that I, I really like. Um, Formerly one sought the feeling of grandeur of man by pointing to his divine origin. This has now become a forbidden way, for at its portal stands the ape. Now, what he's talking about here is evolution was fairly recently discovered when he's writing this. At its portal, at the beginning of the origin of man, stands the ape. Together with other gruesome beasts, grinning as if to say, no further in this direction. Okay, what is that? What is this all about? Well, Nietzsche was writing at a time when uh, there was no such thing as Germany. There were small states that were Germanic. They spoke the same language. They had a, basically same, the same culture, but they weren't unified. And in the 1860s, 50s and 60s, at the time that he was writing, um, they were trying to unify. And so Germans in the different states, so we're talking about like Prussia. Prussia is the big one. Um, but Baden, Württemberg, all, all these little feudal that had like a duke in charge of it, things like that. Um, they were trying to unify so they could have a, an economy that could compete with England, with Britain, for example. And so they're using culture as a way to bring Germany together. And so there was a lot of this going on, looking to divine origin, like we are the Nordics, um, you ever heard that saying, uh, it's not over till the fat lady sings? So um, anybody know what that's from? So that's from an opera by Wagner, by Richard Wagner, who was a friend of Nietzsche. He's a great German um, composer, one of the greatest composers of all time, and he made an opera called The Flight of the Valkyries. Maybe you've heard of that. And it goes on for four hours. And it, was, it goes on so long that nobody really knew when it was over. 
And at the very, very end, there's this overweight woman who sings a solo. And so this uh, slogan came up, it's not over till the fat lady sings. That's where that comes from. So Wagner's, um, Wagner's work, along with Nietzsche, was uh, uh, trying to get Germans to think back to their divine origin, that they have this great origin altogether, all the Germanic states. And Nietzsche is making this, he's saying that's problematic. Because if you go back and back, what you're going to find are monkeys and apes. But we're not divine at all, we are beasts in our origin. So this is a very genealogical method, right? Saying that, that there's, no, there's no tracing back to any kind of godly origin. It's, it's um, the opposite. Does that make sense? Blank stairs means yes or no? <laughs> kind of. OK, so Nietzsche was a very enigmatic uh, thinker. And so that, that theory kind of sat out there for a while. It was distorted by the Nazis. Um, they, they took Nietzsche. In fact, Nietzsche's sister was a Nazi. She, uh, you know, he died young, and she lived much longer into the Nazi period and uh, brought Hitler to the house and said, yes, my brother would have supported what you're doing and all of this, which is absolutely not true. But it, so it kind of sat out there like a interesting, but what do you do with it kind of theory until this bald French guy comes along. This is Michel Foucault, who's pretty much my favorite philosopher. And he looks back at Nietzsche again, and he says, no, Nietzsche was onto something. OK, so I'll read through it and then try to explain this. Historical sense has more in common with medicine than philosophy. In other words, it kind of like dissects. It cuts into things. It cuts the body apart and opens it up, looks at all the gross stuff inside. Make sense? Let's look at the dirt in our history. It should not surprise us that Nietzsche occasionally employs the phrase, employs the phrase historically and physiologically. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Um, since among the philosophers' idiosyncrasies is a complete denial of the body. Now, what he's referring to there is uh, the greatest modern philosopher is uh, Hegel, and Hegel has this idea of uh, this. Uh, thing called mind, that there's this thing floating out there called mind. And as uh, scholars, we are all sort of tapping into this mind, world, global mind, with no um, recognition that he is a physical man. It's this uh, mind-body split. Yeah. And Hegel was, Hegel kind of set the tone. There is a saying that um, all philosophy is a footnote to Hegel. Hegel figured out all the problems. Everybody's just sort of like making addendums to what Hegel said. Okay, this includes as well the absence of a historical sense, a hatred for the idea of development, Egyptianism. I'll come back to that. That's a pretty weird thing to say, Egyptianism. The obstinate placing of conclusions at the beginning of making last things first. Okay, what he's saying is what social scientists and historians often do is they have a theory and then they look back in history to try to prove it. Uh, some of you are in science. Is that a scientific thing to do? What do you do? The opposite. The opposite. Right? Um, some of your professors might have told you. Uh, don't manipulate the data to fit your conclusions. Manipulate your conclusions to fit your data, right? But social scientists and historians have been doing the opposite, making last things first. The conclusion, the last thing, becomes the first thing. And then you look for evidence um, selectively to prove your thesis, right? I, my 12th graders aren't even supposed to be doing that, and yet these great Historians have been doing that. History has a more important task than to be a handmaid into philosophy. In other words, historians have a theory about the world and then they sort of impose it on the history instead of looking at what the history actually was. To recount the necessary birth of truth and values. 
It should become a differential knowledge of energies and failings, heights and degenerations, poisons and antidotes. In other words, look at the good along with the bad. Look at the bad along with the good. Its task is to become a curative science. So within the field that, that I work in, um, or more generally social science, we've been kind of struggling with the idea of how much of a science is this really? Is it even possible to study human culture and history in a scientific way? And Foucault is really the one um, kind of nailing that problem. It's a major problem. Okay, Egyptianism. I said I'd come back to that. What he's referring to there is uh, the, the sort of gentleman class in, let's say, England or Europe more generally in the late 1800s. Um, one of their major preoccupations was to figure out the history of ancient Egypt. Okay, so if you had enough wealth, which you had to have enough wealth if you were going to go to Oxford, Cambridge, um, you'd go on an expedition to the Middle East. Yeah? You'd go to Egypt, visit the pyramids, do a little amateur archaeology because you were allowed to do things as an, as an amateur back then. Uh, that was kind of the way things were. Everybody was, uh, you didn't have to have a degree in it, you just sort of dabble. And they would do that in order to find that glorious origin, which traces back somewhere to Egypt or maybe to Babylon, somewhere probably in the Middle East. And so that's what he's talking about, that, that need to go to the Middle East and find your divine origin, Egyptianism. I think that's what he's referring to. Uh, even nowadays, you see in like, kids' movies all these you know, Indiana Jones types who go and they try to find the lost secrets of ancient so-and-so with all this power, right? It, it's a silly thing. You only use it kind of for kids nowadays, but uh, it really was a thing. Okay, a local example of post-colonialism is something called the Solens Obayeskere debate. Uh, that debate is a debate over Captain Cook. So you see Captain Cook's ship there. This is a banner of the god Lono. And the debate is over the question, did Hawaiians think Captain Cook was the god Lono or not? Uh, the reason this is post-colonial is because Obayeskere is uh, from a post-colonial society. Not India, but the island off the coast of India, Sri Lanka. So they're both anthropologists. Salens was um, one of the top uh, uh, anthropologists on the Pacific. And uh, he was at University of Chicago. And Obayeskere was uh, at... Princeton. So Solins in 1985 wrote a book called Islands of History in which he says Hawaiian saw Cook was Lono. That wasn't controversial at the time. I mean, that's a very established idea. Uh, Obayeskere, being post-colonial, looks at that and he says, did they though? Because in his experience, in India, Sri Lanka, and native cultures around the world, you don't find stories of native people thinking that Europeans are gods. Where you find those stories is in European uh, books and European stories. So what Obeyefter said is, uh, did the Hawaiians really think Cook was Lono or is it the Europeans projecting a kind of god complex onto the Hawaiians? So Europeans go to these foreign places and then they come back and they tell the story, right? They say, oh, those guys, they thought I was a god. They carried me around on this thing. Oh, but then they tried to throw me into the volcano. Um, <laughs> that idea of uh, natives throwing, especially Hawaiians, throwing uh, Europeans into the volcano is so ingrained in Western culture. Um, I may have mentioned last week that I worked on a film that's coming out in November. It's called The Islands. Uh, I ended up with a credit as co-writer of it. And I tried to 
<laughs> it had this idea in it that they're going to throw um, they're going to throw these sacrificed people into the volcano. I tried to take it out, and I end up on the set, and the, the director's like, ah, I just I just couldn't get rid of it. I just had to leave it in. Um, because I think he knows that that idea is, it's very deeply ingrained in the Western psyche and that they have to see it. So um, that narrative right there, you arrive, they lift you up and treat you like a god and then they kill you and eat you or sacrifice you to the volcano goddess. That is all throughout Western culture. That's in popular, um, popular television shows and movies. Um, and I can show you an example after this. It's kind of funny. Uh, so Obayeskere said, Hawaiians didn't think Cook was the god Lono. It's you, Marshall Solins, white man, who thinks that you are a god. And you're just projecting that idea, that god complex that you have, onto the Hawaiians. Why do they have a god complex? Colonization. Right? Colonization is this process that makes the one superior over the other, so you're elevated so much that you think that you are uh, godlike. You become godlike in your own mind. So that was a pretty serious accusation against Solon. So Solon's wrote back. So this is a debate not in snarky uh, Twitter uh, tweets, but with books. So in 1985, the original book came out. In 1992, Obayaskere countered, and then Solens strikes back in 1995. And his book was called How Natives Think, but it had a very sarcastic subtitle. The title of the book, the full title, was How Natives Think About Captain Cook, for example. That was the actual title of the book. Uh, he's, he's pissed, right? So he said, well, just because you're a native Sri Lankan doesn't mean you know how a native Hawaiian thinks. Because this is really a debate over um, Hawaiian perspective, what the Hawaiians thought at the time, right? And at this kind of first contact moment, what did they think? It's still, it's an interesting debate because we still don't know for sure. Overall, it's kind of, it kind of was left at that point but the people who are really, really deep into these um, issues kind of had to give the, the win to Solins, just, just because he had much better mastery of the, of the details. He's a real Pacific anthropologist. Obayeskere wasn't. But they both became very famous from this debate. Okay, so now to get to Edward Said. Said is kind of the titan of uh, post-colonial studies. Um, I think the best quote is actually on the back of his book. His book is called Orientalism. Orientalism is really the creating of the Orient, right? The European goes to the Orient, so usually the Middle East is what he's talking about, but it could be Southeast Asia, it could be anywhere outside of Europe, and then they come back and they tell the story. And they tell the story with their own uh, with the, through their own lens, with their own bias. And the Orient ends up looking in a way that it doesn't look to the natives of that place. Okay, so I think a great quote was um, Albert Hurani said, the theme is the way in which intellectual traditions are created and transmitted. Orientalism is the example Mr. Said uses, and by it he means something precise. The, the scholar who studies the Orient and specifically the Muslim Orient, the imaginative, write, imaginative writer who takes it as a subject and the institutions uh, which have been concerned with teaching it, settling it, ruling it, all have a certain representation or idea of the Orient defined as being other than the Occident, this is the West, mysterious, unchanging, and ultimately inferior. So Europeans go to the Middle East, they come back and write about it as being exotic, but linked in with that exoticness is inferiority. Right? Okay. Uh, any questions right at this point? 
We're going to take a closer look at uh, Orientalism. Let's see. And that's it for my online students.